Hello and welcome to today's lecture recap. So I'll start as usual with a quick review of what we were talking about last time. And the new thing last time was the idea of thermal conductivity. So we had understood that certain materials require more energy per mass to heat them up than other materials. That was the idea of specific heat. But then we had the idea that even though one material might require more energy to heat up to a certain temperature change than another material, the rate at which that happens is actually controlled by another parameter in addition. And so that's the thermal conductivity. And so we understood that if you have two objects at the same temperature, sometimes one thing will feel colder than the other because that object conducts heat better. So you put your hand on a, on a metal object and the heat from your hand is actually able to flow very quickly through the metal. And so it leaves your hand at a higher rate. And so you feel heat coming out of your hand quicker. It cools your hand quicker and it feels colder. Whereas other materials like styrofoam, the heat has a very hard time spreading through the styrofoam. And so when you put your hand on the styrofoam, then the heat heats up from your hand heats up the surface layer of the styrofoam and has a hard time flowing through the rest of the styrofoam. And so now the, the temperature difference between the surface and your hand is very small and it doesn't, it doesn't heat up your, it doesn't, uh, sorry, cool down your hand very quickly at all. And so the specific equation that we ended up with last time governing this heat flow it used the concept of a heat current, and that's basically just how much energy per time is going to be flowing through some surface. So when we talk about heat conduction, we think about a particular medium. And so in this picture, what you have is some object that's maybe held at a, a higher temperature or it's at a higher temperature TH at some particular time. You have some objects that's at a lower temperature and then you have some object in between through which the heat is flowing. These could be all different parts of the same object. So you might have one part that's warmer and one part that's cooler, and then some part in between, and we have heat transfer there. And so the heat current is defined with respect to a particular surface, and it's just how much heat per time is flowing through that surface. Units are joules per second, and so it could be 100 joules per second is flowing through that surface. That's going to be determined by what we call the temperature gradient. It's how quickly is the temperature changing as you move through this material? And so in this situation, we have a hotter temperature on this side, a colder temperature on this side, and the temperature gradient is defined to be that difference in temperatures divided by the length. And so if this length is small, that means there's a very, very large temperature gradient. The temperature changes quickly from one point to a nearby point. And in that case, we get a larger heat current. If we separate the hot part and the cold part over a longer distance, then it's a smaller temperature gradient for the same temperature difference. And that means that the heat flow through that central region is going to be smaller. So we have a basic proportionality between the heat current and the temperature gradient. The factor of area just means that if I, if I take two of those regions instead of one, so if I took two connectors between the hot thing and the cold thing, well, I would expect that there would be an equal heat flow in both of those. And so then the total heat current is going to be double. So that's why you have that the heat current is proportional to the cross-sectional area of this surface through which heat is flowing. And then finally, we have a proportionality constant, the thermal conductivity, which is a basic property of our material. And this is a different property than alpha and a different property than your specific heat. And so you could just basically measure it. You look it up in a table if you want to know what is the thermal conductivity for aluminum or styrofoam or steel. So I want to start with a question today. 
first we're going to understand it conceptually and then we're going to do a quantitative calculation and the question has to do with a situation where you have two objects one at zero degrees one at 100 we're maintaining those temperatures so that heat will flow from the 100 degree object to the zero degree object continuously but in this situation it's actually flowing through two different materials k this one on the right with a smaller thermal conductivity and the one on the left with a larger thermal conductivity and so our first question is as we let this settle down to a steady heat flow where the temperatures of various parts are no longer changing, what is the temperature in the middle going to settle down to? Will it be equal to one equal to 50 degrees, halfway between the two, greater than 50 degrees, or less than 50 degrees? And after we think about that, we're going to actually calculate this temperature. So take a minute, pause the video, think about what you would think and then we'll do the calculation. Okay, so in this case, the answer is that because the thermal conductivity K1 is greater, that means that K2, this material on the right, it's a better insulator, and this is a better conductor. And so just intuitively, what we might expect is that since we're being insulated, from the 100 degree side better than we're insulated from the zero degree side, it'll feel colder in the middle uh, compared to if the situation were reversed. Okay, so, so that's just some intuition. We're going to use our equations to actually understand and uh, why that is and, and prove it. Um, but that's sort of a first step just to develop this intuition for what the conductivity means. We're using the fact that the opposite of conductivity, opposite of having a good conductivity is being a good insulator. And so actually this picture here that, I've, that I sort of came up with uh, really emphasizes that. Okay, so this is just taking this question that says K1 is greater than K2 and putting it into kind of real life practice where I'm going to take K1 to be much, much larger than K2. I'm going to take K1 to be copper, which is a very good thermal conductor, and K2 is going to be styrofoam, which is a very good insulator, a very poor thermal conductor. And so if we translated this K1 greater than K2 into sort of a physical picture here, you can see that our intuition that the central temperature is going to be less than 50 should be correct putting your hand in there, it's well insulated from the boiling water by all of the styrofoam. But the copper is going to conduct heat very well. It'll cool down very quickly. And the temperature of the copper will be nearly zero degrees Celsius. If I actually think about what that temperature in the middle is going to be, it'll end up actually being much less than one degree Celsius because the thermal conductivity of copper is actually more than a thousand times the thermal conductivity of the styrofoam. Okay. So one of the things we talked about last time is that in this situation, the thing that is constant through both parts is the heat current. Once we're in a steady state situation, whatever heat flows into the styrofoam also has to flow from the styrofoam to the copper and from the copper into the ice. Otherwise you would have energy building up and the temperatures would be changing. So our assumption that we're in a steady state heat flow means that those, those heat currents are the same. And it was maybe confusing why that would be if copper is such a good conductor and styrofoam is a bad conductor, but now we can see it. So if it's true that the middle temperature ends up being close to zero, like zero point one degrees Celsius, then what you notice is that the gradient here is going to be much smaller. The thermal gradient from this side to this side um, is going to be much smaller for the case of the copper and much larger for the case of the styrofoam where we go from 100 to say 0 0.1 degrees Celsius. And so even though the conductivity is higher here, if we refer to our formula, the heat current can be the same. So for the copper, we have a big conductivity and a small temperature gradient. For the styrofoam, 
we have a small conductivity and a large temperature gradient. And the end, in the end, it works out that the heat currents are the same in both cases. So now we're going to use that equation to actually calculate the central temperature in the case where we have a general conductivity K1 and a general conductivity K2. Okay. So that's our next question. Calculate T in terms of K1 and K2. All right, so take a minute, pause your video, and then I'm gonna work through this carefully. All right, so we're ready to go here. That doesn't seem to be, there we go. So let me draw the picture again. We have zero degrees. We have our object here with K1, object here with K2, and we have 100 degrees. We're being asked to figure out what is the temperature in the middle after a long time. And so I'll write that as an, our unknown variable T that we want to find. And now my advice for this kind of problem, it's basically gonna be the same advice that I've been giving for all the problems we've had so far in the course. We can first focus on the individual parts of the system, see what's happening with those parts and write an equation relevant for those individual parts and then understand how the parts are related. So, I'm going to write down heat current H1 for the object on the left, heat current H2 for the object on the right. And then what's happening here is that these objects are basically both conducting heat and we can express that heat current for each object using our basic conductivity equation. So H1 is going to be K1 times the area and then times the hotter temperature minus the cooler temperature. So that's T minus zero over the distance L. H2 similarly is going to be K2 times A. And then the hotter temperature is 100 minus the cooler temperature, which is T and divided by L. Next, we say, how are these parts related. So how are the two heat currents related? And we said that because it's in a steady state, energy conservation will tell us that H1 is equal to H2. And so we can set these two quantities, one and two, we'll set equation one, uh, the right hand sides of equation one and two equal to each other. And so that gives us that K1A times T over L equals K2A times 100 minus T over L. And now we can cancel the A's from both sides, cancel the L's from both sides. And simplifying that, I get K1T equals K2 times 100 minus K2 times T. I'm going to collect the T's on one side. So I get T, I'll just skip a step here. So I get K1 plus K2 T equals K2 times 100. And so finally I get K2 over K1 plus K2 times 100. So that's our result. It's completely general, works for any K1 and K2. And so what we see here is that if you had two identical materials, then K1 would equal K2 and our final temperature in the middle would be one half of 100 or 50 degrees. But if K1 is greater than K2, as is specified in the question, then what we see is that that fraction is going to be significantly less than a half. And so our temperature is going to be closer to zero. Okay, so for the rest of the class, 
I want to talk about a situation that's a little bit more interesting because it's not a steady state situation. So a lot of times when we're thinking about thermal conductivity, we're actually thinking about a situation where we have some material, in this case, it's going to be a liquid, and we actually want to change the temperature of that liquid. So in this case, maybe we have a bowl of liquid that was at room temperature, and we place it in contact with a bowl of ice water that would be at zero degrees, and we would like to know how is the temperature of the liquid on top going to change with time. Okay. And so what I want you to do first is just make a prediction for the graph of temperature versus time if we were able if we were actually going to uh, if we we're actually going to graph that. And so uh, just to just to show you, I mean this this setup is something that I showed in class, but here's here's the Here's the actual demo for today. Um, so what I'm going to do is take my bowl of water, which is at which is at room temperature. Um, I maybe it's actually a little bit a little bit colder. Um, I have a thermometer here. Um, so this is this is one of these uh, thermometers that's it's digital. Maybe it's based on the resistance of some material. And uh, so my room temperature is 20. Um, I actually already cooled this water down earlier, so it might end up being at a lower temperature than 20. We'll have to see what it, what it turns out to be. Um, yeah, it looks like the initial temperature of, of my water right now is sorry, 13 degrees. Okay. And so what I'm going to do now is just place that into the cooler where... So this cooler is just to isolate my experiment from the environment. So what I what I have in the cooler is a bowl of ice water, and if we if we check, uh, so I'll put just just to show you, I'll put the thermometer in the ice water. Um, so that's that's going into equilibrium. Should be should be getting down to zero if uh, it works. Okay, so there it is. Um, so the ice water is zero as as we hoped. Um, now instead, I'm going to put the thermometer into the other dish, and I'm going to put that onto the ice water, and then we're just going to watch the the temperature as a function of time. And so actually, you can already see um, it, it very quickly went down um, initially. It was 13, now it's 12. Um, and then we're just gonna um, watch that as a function of time. And if I really wanted to do this experiment carefully, what I should probably do is, is kind of stir that liquid on the top to, to make sure that it's all a uniform temperature at every time, uh, but I'm not gonna do that now. Uh, so in class, I actually had, um, had my son in to take some data while I was teaching the rest of the class. And so I will show that uh, towards the end of the class. But right now, our job is to make a prediction for what this is going to look like. Okay. And so I had various people come up um, and give their ideas for what the graph of temperature versus time is going to look like. And somehow the intuition was that well, it should start at, in, in class, it was, I think, 18 degrees Celsius. And the intuition was somehow that it will decrease, um, but it won't like continue to decrease at a constant rate. It will actually decrease, let me, sh let me sh show my drawing here. It will actually decrease um, sort of slower than that as time goes on. So the, the feeling was that actually the final graph of temperature versus time for that water should be going a little bit slower. Okay. Just let's just check on our check on our uh, water temperature here. So it's actually already gone down to six. So fairly quickly, it's gone down to six degrees. And so somehow our prediction is maybe that it will go down. Um, it will take a longer time to get down to three degrees and and sort of cool slower and slower as time goes on. Okay, so I won't 
actually explain that quite yet, but we're, we're going to actually understand quantitatively from our equations for heat current, what is the prediction for like the slope of this line as time goes on. And eventually in this class, we're going to get a prediction for the actual equation of that temperature versus time. Okay. So, so this is my, this is my question now to you. If you want to understand how this temperature is changing with time, a good way to approach it is just to think about what is that temperature change going to be in a short amount of time? Okay. So the graph overall, it's sort of complicated and curvy, but if we just focus on a little bit of time and try to predict how much is the temperature going to change during that time, um, then we can put it all together. Then we could kind of iterate that understanding and understand how the temperature is going to change in the first minute and the second minute and the third minute and so forth. Okay. So the first question that we're going to think about is just, what is the change in temperature of the water on top? And I've got sort of a simplified version of that picture now um, that occurs in a small time of one second. So I'm using the little d's to indicate that these are relatively short times. We expect a relatively short, um, small change in temperature during this time. And so, so here's my question. Okay, and it's quite, it's, it's somewhat complicated if we just think about it we try to think about the whole system at once and try to put everything together in our head. And so what we're going to do as usual is focus first on various parts of the system. Okay. So since the question is asking about the water on top, what is the change in temperature of the water on top? Then we're going to focus on that part first. Okay. So here's, here's a clicker question to have you think about this part on top. And so in terms of its interaction with the rest of the system, the important thing is that there is some heat current that is flowing out of the water on top and down through the metal bowl and into the ice. And so if we just want to draw a picture of the situation of the water on top, then we could draw something like this. Um, the important things here are going to be the mass, the temperature of that water at our initial time and the specific heat of the water is going to come into it. And then we have this heat current. So think about this question for a minute and then we will we'll talk about that. Okay. Actually, I will, I'll write something out here. All right. So let's try to understand how much is the temperature going to change? And so we, we can start with our basic knowledge that the change in temperature of our water, it's related to how much energy actually flows out of the water during that time. So we have our basic equation that Q is MC delta T. If someone asks us about how much the temperature of the water changes, then the the thing that we've learned is that, sorry, that is not focusing. There we go. The thing we've learned is that uh, we just look at how much heat flows out. And once we know how much heat flows out, then we will, uh, we will just divide that by MC. Okay. So what is Q? So in this question, we're not really given Q. We have to figure it out. And so from our diagram, what we see is that you have a heat current H. And so we just have to remember this is energy per time flowing out of the system. What we want is the total energy that flows out of the system in a time dt. So in a time dt, what we're going to have is that Q, so Q is going to be a negative quantity because we're losing energy. So that's going to be equal to the energy flowing out per time times this time that passes by. Okay. So that's the way that we use our information provided in the question. Um, we don't know what H is yet. We'll figure that out in the next part. But if we knew it, then Q would be equal to minus H times DT. 
And now we can plug everything in. Um, so our change in temperature, this is the, the thing that we're being asked, the change in temperature in one second is going to be equal to uh, Q over MC, which is now minus H over MC times this change in time. Okay, so this is answer, answer B for the clicker question. And now we can move on to thinking about the next part of the system. Okay. So we have this result. We know M, we know C, we know DT. The only thing we don't know is H. And so what we expect, what we've learned about H is that it's going to be determined by some temperature gradient and by a thermal conductivity. And in this case, it's the thermal conductivity of the bowl that's important. Okay, so we have our water on top with a temperature T, we have the water on the bottom with a temperature zero, and the basic equation for thermal conductivity is then going to tell us what H is in terms of all of these other quantities. Okay, so we apply our formula, TH in this case is T because that's the warmer temperature, TC is zero, and A and L are quantities that are given. Their properties of this steel bowl. And so we basically just end up with the simple equation that H is equal to Ka times T over L. And this is the thermal conductivity of the steel itself. That's the, that's the interface separating the warmer water on top from the colder water on the bottom. Okay. So we take that H, we plug it in to our previous equation that gave us the change in temperature, and then we get our final result, which is that the change in temperature is equal to this right-hand side. Okay. And we could plug everything in and get some specific number of joules if we want to. Great, so now let's go back and use what we've learned to try to understand whether we're right with this prediction that the slope of the graph is going to decrease in magnitude as time goes on. And we'll understand why would that be from a physical point of view. Okay. So in order to make contact with the slope of the graph, what I'm going to do is take this side and just divide both sides by the little dt. Okay, okay so the slope of the graph is is the rise over the run. So it's the change in big T over the change in little t. And so from our previous equation, we get this thing. Okay. And so what we see is that the slope of the graph is equal to negative some constant that we can get by plugging in the numbers times the temperature of the water on top. And this lines up perfectly with what we expected, because it says that as the temperature decreases and gets closer to zero, then the slope of the graph should also decrease in magnitude and get closer and closer to zero. Okay, And so that lines up with what we expect. And then we can go back and ask, you know, why, what, where did that come from? Um, so there's an even more basic way to understand it. And it's really coming from this heat equation. So the, this heat current equation, just that this thing is proportional to the temperature difference. And so as that temperature difference between the two sides gets smaller, then the heat flow, the rate of energy going from one to the other per second is going to decrease as well. Okay, so that's the basic physics of why, why the slope is getting smaller and smaller in magnitude. Okay. Final thing I wanted to do is actually use this equation and then to tell you exactly what is this function according to our prediction here. Okay, So this is an example of something that we call a differential equation in math. Um, it's a little bit complicated because it has the derivative of a function and a function in the same equation. But these kinds of equations can be solved. And you'll see that probably next term or maybe a little bit this term and definitely a lot in second year. For now, I don't expect that you'll necessarily be able to solve an equation like this, but 
you can at least understand what the solution is. So if we think about this equation, it's saying that the derivative with respect to time of this function t, so t is a function of time, the equation says that derivative with respect to time is equal to some constant times the time itself. The rate of decrease of t is proportional to t. And if we think about our calculus and we ask what sort of function, if you differentiate it, gives back the same function up to a constant, well, the answer is an exponential function. Okay. So e to the x, e to the t, the derivative is just e to the t again. If you have e to the sum constant times t, the derivative, let me, let me write that down to be totally clear here. Okay. So uh, d by dt of e to the t is e to the t. d by dt of e to the constant times t using our chain rule is that constant times e to the ct. So you get exponential, differentiate now the exponent using the chain rule, and that gives us c. And so in our situation, we want uh, dt by dt is equal to minus ka over mclt. So this is sort of the constant that we need to put in our exponential. And so that tells us that t, um, well, if we if we choose e to the minus ka over mclt, that would work, but also any sort of, we're allowed to put any sort of constant out in front and it still works. Okay, so I, I, could, have, I could have put a constant here and here or here and here. Um, so we have a little bit of freedom there in solving that differential equation. There's multiple solutions, but we know that our temperature at time zero should be 18 degrees or 20 degrees or 15 degrees, whatever it was. Um, and so we just choose to place that constant there in front. Okay. Um, so there it is. I, I will quickly um, actually show the data from, from class that we took earlier. So give me a moment. I will load that up here to show you um, the actual data that my son took during the, during the class. Um, so we go to sheets here okay and i just need to so i'm going to stop sharing the slide on this computer and i'm going to share the slide on the other computer Let's do that. Okay, and so this was the this was the actual data that um, that we took. It's actually a little bit hard. The temperature was changing very quickly at the start, and so the graph is a little wonky there. But more or less, you can see that you get a big slope, and then the slope uh, got smaller quickly, and so it's consistent with this kind of exponential decay of the temperature. Okay. One final comment, if we had done this experiment properly, very carefully, we should have been stirring the liquid on top to make sure that it was all maintaining the same temperature. So in our theoretical analysis, that's what we assumed, that the liquid on top was all sort of one temperature and the liquid on the bottom was always zero. Um, in the real experiment, we weren't very careful. And so probably what happened was that there were temperature gradients within the water. There could have been convection effects and so we might not expect that this theory this graph that we took experimentally would line up exactly with our theoretical predictions um, but at least qualitatively you see that it, it is giving what we expected all right so that's it for today we'll talk more about thermal conductivity on monday and have a great weekend